Hi, Lara. Hi, Frank. Um, thanks for sort of making the time to um, to talk to me on um, what is some kind of um, you know conversation interview sort of. It's not a show, but it's something you know that I've uh, I, I do now and then. And since since uh, Israel started bombing Gaza again, I've done more and more of these. Um, because it's, I think it's important to actually talk and share our experiences and and try to find a way forward, right? How do we move on? No, not move on. How do we, how do we make sure this moment actually changes everything? So um, I wanted to start actually by asking you because I know you've got um, re relatives and and friends in Gaza. Um, do you, do you hear from them? What's what's the what are they telling you right now? You know, there's nothing that they're telling me that the world hasn't already heard. Um, people in Gaza have been desperate to draw the world's attention to their plight, and they have done everything for us by documenting this moment that they're living in. Um, and putting it out in the world for everyone to see. And the testimonies of my own friends and family are the same things that these citizen journalists are putting out for us. They're the same testimonies that we're hearing all across Gaza. There's almost no food. There's no clean water. If you even find water to drink, it's very dirty. It's getting colder in Gaza. The, almost all of the hospitals in Gaza have stopped functioning completely. The last that I heard, there was only nine partially functioning hospitals in Gaza, but over 22 hospitals, I believe, have closed, either because of direct Israeli attack or the siege on fuel and electricity or because they simply don't have supplies. There is a tremendous sense of fear and panic all the time. People are very tired. Um, of course they are. They've been living under over 44 days now of uninterrupted, indiscriminate bombardment while they remain caged and starved and dehydrated. And for those who are injured, there is no, no treatment. We hear horrific stories of people being amputated with no anesthesia because of the ban on medical supplies. We hear horrific stories of women having to undergo C-sections again without anesthesia. We hear stories of you know, children who are the only survivors in their family we hear stories of people who have escaped bombardment once or twice only to succumb the third time. Um, every story is horrific. And until now, I can say that most of the people close to me are still alive. Um, two days ago, we heard from my cousin's husband that he lost 36 members of his family in an Israeli airstrike on their home. Um, my family, some of them happen to be sheltering in a refugee camp, which has been bombarded almost every single day, multiple times a day. There were a lot of close calls. Some members of my extended family have started to keep a Google document of all of the people from their family that they have lost in airstrikes. So there's a tremendous sense of death and destruction and torture, but in mass. And you know, I was processing this the other night. In, in a world without genocide, when you go about your daily life and you encounter loss in a moment, loss doesn't come the way that it does in to Palestinians in Gaza in this moment. 
I mean, we're hearing of people who are losing 30, 40, 50, 60 members of their family all at once. I heard of a woman who lost over 80 members of her family who was being interviewed on a, in a corporate media piece. But in the ordinary world, it's difficult enough when you encounter loss of one person. And I think that's a reason for deep reflection. Why is it that the world is willing to watch Palestinians as a people, as a society, undergo deep torture as a community, layers and layers of pain that will not be healed in this lifetime, nor will it be healed for many, many generations to come. This is something that is not only going to traumatize me and my children, but their children and their children going on and going forward. So I have a lot of questions about, about why this is allowed to happen and what's the cost of human life and what's the acceptable level of torture of an entire people. You know, we started to see some Congress people in the US finally slowly call for a ceasefire. And I was checking the comment section, I believe it was a congressperson from Oregon who was one of the latest ones to call for a ceasefire. And the comment section was, so you reached the threshold of Palestinians who have been killed. So that was your threshold. Um, thanks, but you know, too late. It should have happened a long time ago and it still hasn't happened. So it's, it's, it's a really difficult time and, and the words are not sufficient. I mean, every time we try to find new formulations of words to try to express to people how torturous the situation is, like we're always trying to engage in new analogies and we're always trying to say, oh, but this is really bad because if you compare this to this and you know, we're trying to, to awaken people. And I don't know if, if any of it is helpful, but um, words are not sufficient in this moment. Thanks, Lana. And you know, I've, I've been trying to, to think as well about the fact that, in a way, if we, if we leave our sort of, you know, Western society's bubble, Israel and the US uh, and the UK and France and, you know, are very isolated. I was even like, I was checking today how many countries actually refer to Hamas as a terrorist organization. It's, it's a very tiny number of countries. Um, and when we, there was the vote at the UN General Assembly a few weeks back about a ceasefire, it was an overwhelmingly, you know, in favor of a ceasefire, only the countries that, you know, we were living in a way opposed it. But Listening to you describing what's happening in Gaza, what's happening to families, to people losing like 80 members of their families and stuff. I've, um, you know, I remember at the very early stages of this uh, massacre, some people mentioning genocide and me going, hey, we don't even have to go there. There's apartheid, there's, you know, crimes against humanity, uh, war, you know, crime against humanity. It's, it's, it's high enough, you know, apartheid in the list of the worst crime against humanity is like, pretty much number two, right? It's like very high up. But the more it went, the more it continued, the more, and the rhetoric of the Israeli authorities and, and the army, um, I find it now how not to call it genocide. I know you're, you're a lawyer. Um, would you describe it as genocide? It's absolutely genocide. Uh, Israel is committing genocide against Palestinians. And it, it's not just my opinion. It's the opinion of the scholars of genocide and state crime who at various moments uh, in this current crisis have come out and said very clearly that Israel is committing genocide against Palestinians. There have been numerous legal scholars like the Center for Constitutional Rights who have issued legal opinions on this saying the same thing. 
Craig Mochaber's resignation letter from the UN referred to this as a textbook case of genocide. Roz Siegel came out very early in the massacre to refer to this also as a textbook case of genocide, and he's a Jewish genocide scholar. Um, you had over 800 genocide scholars pen a letter saying the exact same thing. You had 47 state crime scholars come out and say that Israel was practicing the annihilation phase of genocide against Palestinians. Um, the, the, the legal and scholarly consensus is very much that Israel is practicing genocide. And genocide, we know, is a legal definition under two international treaties, and it's clearly defined. And if we apply what is happening right now and assess whether or not it meets the, the legal threshold, it certainly does. I mean, as you said, we've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of statements of genocidal intent at the highest levels of Israeli military and government. And we've also seen multiple genocidal acts. Um, you know, just the, the deprivation of food and water alone to an entire people who are caged, who have no other way of getting food and water. Even if Israel didn't drop a single airstrike on Gaza, that policy alone is genocidal. They're starving people to death. And in fact, people have already starved to death. They have already been dehydrated to death. It was the director of Al-Shifa Hospital who said uh, in a statement a couple of days ago that was reported on and picked up in the media that people were crying from thirst. They were screaming from thirst. The UN World Food Program a couple of days ago also warned of an imminent risk of starvation. That's a genocidal act. Leaving aside the indiscriminate, uninterrupted bombardment that has pulverized Gaza, that has destroyed half of the buildings in Gaza, leaving that completely aside. So Israel has committed multiple genocidal acts with the requisite genocidal intent, and that's all you need to make a showing of genocide. I think part of the you know the reluctance to to label it as such comes from people in the public discourse who are getting their information from pundits who don't even know what genocide is don't know don't realize that it's a legal definition they think it's just an opinion that they can have and then you know they sort of spout that misinformation to their audience and oftentimes the people with the least information have the the loudest you know voices and 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 the and the largest megaphone so when i heard pierce morgan talk about how he didn't think that israel was committing genocide um i said you should leave it to the scholars because you don't know what genocide is in order for you to even have an opinion about this i mean it's like having an opinion about you know if a specific surgery is required on an individual and you're not a physician why would you can't you're not entitled to have that opinion so you shouldn't talk about it you should bring a scholar on to discuss it um so that's you know we're definitely seeing this sort of two discourses we're seeing the discourse of the scholars in this moment the legal experts um and we're also seeing the discourse of the Western governments and the corporate media that parrots and promotes the talking points of the Western governments. So just yesterday when John Kirby came out and said, oh, people have been throwing around the word genocide. It's not a genocide. And by the way, what Hamas did was completely genocide. But what Israel's doing is not genocide. Again, you're not engaging in a, in a proper legal analysis here. The legal analysis when engaged in points clearly to genocide. Um, when one of the, the the individuals in the Biden administration came out and said that the U.S. has a, quote, rigorous process for genocide, and we have not determined that genocide has taken place here, it begs the question, what's your rigorous process? I mean, everybody has the same process. The U.S. is party to the Genocide Convention, and it's the same definition for the U.S. as it is everywhere else. So what are you referring to? This is... The difficulty is that when, when you live in the world of politics where misinformation can go unchallenged and then people believe that, there's a great danger there. Um, but I'm a lawyer and I look at the treaties and I look at the texts and I just apply the situation um, 
the, the law to the facts. And, and when you do that, you can only reach one conclusion, and that's that Israel is committing genocide in this moment. And that genocide, like, let's be very clear also about what it is. The point is not just to say that Israel is committing genocide. Of course it is. But what is it, what is all of this a part of? And I think that's what we really need to understand. We need to understand that this genocide is the latest form of colonial domination and oppression that Israel is exercising against a people that it has been ethnically cleansing from their homes for over 75 years. It's the latest tool of oppression. And that's really what we need to be talking about. Um, you know, we spoke about apartheid. A part that Israel was is committing apartheid against Palestinians is the consensus of the human rights organizations of this world. And that was their consensus in 2021 and 2022. The International Criminal Court did not bring charges against Israel for apartheid. And yet everybody knew that Israel was committing apartheid against Palestinians. And that impunity, that unchecked violation, grave violation of international law, paved the way for this genocide. Seven decades of impunity is what got us here. And, and just before genocide, we had this consensus of apartheid that yet again went completely unchecked. And so it became very easy for Israel in this moment, realizing that it had the full support of the US and the EU, realizing that it was going to ignore entirely any efforts from the UN if the UN was able to exercise any efforts at all. Um, it became very easy for it to enact genocide. Yeah. I think what you're saying is actually crucial for because for the majority of like the general public and stuff that have been maybe sort of educated by the mainstream media, they they don't understand that for people that have followed the Palestine question for many years and stuff. This is, as you mentioned, a long process of ethnic cleansing that started pre-48. And that, you know, they, they're trying the, the, you know, the drop that drop ethnic cleansing, they're trying the bombing, you know, ethnic cleansing. But this is part of the, and that's why what like drives me mad when people say you cannot have peace with Hamas, because Hamas wants the, uh, wants to throw the Jews into the sea which is false as well. Anyone who reads uh, the updated Hamas charter and anyone who reads the political platforms when they uh, went for the elections, uh, Hamas has accepted a two-state solution many times over now. And by accepting a two-state solution, it means that they recognize the existence of Israel, if you know, go down that road. But what people don't fo focus on is that Israel doesn't accept the Palestinian people, right? Israel makes it very clear that Eretz Israel, actually from the river to the sea, is for the Jewish people and the Jewish people only. And um, so I'd like you to, to comment on this again, because um, I find it so irritating, you know, to, to have to say over and over again, listen to them talking, listen to the Israelis talking. You know, they are saying it openly. Well, there's certainly a, a question of projection there. If the argument is that Palestinians can't be free because then they will expel Jewish Israelis from the land, or that Hamas only wants to wipe Israel off the map, well, then we have to go back to the creation of the state of Israel and understand that Israel already did wipe Palestine off the map. Not Palestinians, because Palestinians are still on the land. It expelled many of us to neighboring countries, but millions of Palestinians still remain on the land of historic Palestine, between Gaza, what is considered Israel, and the West Bank. And so this notion that, well, we can't be free because if we were free, then we would wipe them off the map. Well, it's what they already did to us. You know, in 1948, they established their settler colony on 78% of historic Palestine. In 1967, they occupied the remaining 22% of historic Palestine. And they continued to move Jewish Israeli settlers to the occupied West Bank, which constitutes the largest bit of land that they have not established their state on. 
So I think it's deeply disingenuous to try to come up with any reasons why people should not be free. You know, this whole debate is moot. People deserve freedom. Um, I was on TRT yesterday talking about social media. And the presenter was explaining how the hashtag Free Palestine far exceeded the hashtag I stand with Israel across all the social media platforms. I mean, something like insane, like billions on TikTok contrasted with not even 400 million uh, I stand with Israel, right? And I thought, you know, this is actually really indicative of what both movements stand for. And it gives us just like an indication of like what's at stake here. Palestinians are saying free Palestine. We're calling for freedom. We're calling for human rights. We're calling for the respect and the dignity that we have been denied for over seven decades. When your hashtag is I stand with Israel, the only statement that you're making is that you are in agreement with the actions of a state. What are those actions? Like query what those actions are. And that is everything that you need to know. If one people is asking for freedom and the other people is just asking you to blindly accept everything that it is doing, then it's really clear who from this paradigm is the oppressed and who is the oppressor. And I'll say just one other thing on this. We've seen as part of the, the many genocidal statements that have been made by government and military and also like in the Israeli media and, and society more broadly, we've seen a lot of statements about we're coming for Lebanon next, we're coming for Iran next, we're taking all the land, including from military. So again, there's something deeply disingenuous from people trying to apply an ethnic cleansing suspicion to Palestinians who are on our own land and who have been denied freedom for over 75 years and who we have been victim of ethnic cleansing, when in reality, they are the ones who have been ethnic cleansing and continue to call for more ethnic cleansing. And in fact, have come out in government memos and, and through appearances in media saying that really the plan should be to move all of these Palestinians from Gaza to other countries. And we saw Danny Dannon come out and say, yeah, maybe we can do a resettlement project where each country takes a few Palestinians from Gaza and that way they're just spread out all over the world. I mean, excuse me, these are our houses. You stole our houses. And, and, and you, not only did you steal them in 1948 and 1967, but you're stealing them again. And the majority of people in Gaza are refugees from the creation of the state of Israel on their homes and on their land. They were pushed into Gaza. So the notion that you can just freely talk about forced displacement as like some sort of like a humanitarian initiative, when in reality, forced displacement is a crime against humanity under international law. It's so twisted. It's like up is down, down is up, and everything is, is the opposite of what it is. No, God, Palestinians should not be resettled. They deserve to be on their land. Who, who, in their, who in the world, I ask any person in the world, who would accept such a premise? If I go to you in your house, in the United States, in Europe, in France, in Germany, and I say to you, you should accept to be resettled, you and all of your, 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 your compatriots, all of them, you should, each and every single one of you should go to a different country, and now I'll take your country. How does that sound to you? It doesn't make sense. Why do we expect Palestinians to accept a logic which nobody else would accept for themselves. And that is a question that I have had for decades now. I want to ask you again, because you're a lawyer and you've mentioned international law quite a few times. There's something that we, we need to hold on, uh, even when it comes to Palestine, is, is the hope for, at one point or another, accountability. You know, Israel is committing major war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, apartheid in Palestine. This is not me saying it, as you mentioned before, it's, it's the, the common, you know, a common ground of NGOs and, 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 and lawyers and international law specialists. Um, there's been a few complaints to the ICC over the last few weeks, um, 
the you know CCR in the US um, also uh, has got a legal case against I think Biden in Belgium here we we're working on a legal case as well against the Belgium government because and again correct me if I'm wrong I think some countries try to avoid saying it's genocide because genocide implies that you as a country needs to stop it right well it's uh, not it's not up to them to determine if that's the case by yeah, avoiding yeah. saying it right yeah. so their obligations under the genocide convention are there whether or not they admit that they okay. have been triggered and under the genocide convention um parties have a, a duty to prevent yeah. genocide and yeah. the standard for that is is quite low so um in the case of the Biden administration for example when you look at the lawsuit filed by the Center for Constitutional Rights what they have argued is that in financing and arming and providing the diplomatic cover for Israel's genocide of Palestinians um ignoring the facts on the ground entirely and living in a totally alternate reality bubble where they just deny that any of this is taking place while at the same time their representatives cannot even make the statement that Israel is complying with international law, right? We saw that happen. We saw them be questioned the Biden administration is Israel complying with international law, they refused to answer. So what the CCR has said is they said, well, you are in violation of your obligations under the genocide convention to prevent genocide and now you are complicit in genocide. And so that is an actionable claim and that's what they have um done by filing this lawsuit in in district court. how do we make sure as activists but also as lawyers that this is a moment that indeed changes everything because you know you 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 old enough sorry to have known about operation castled and in 2012 and in 14 and in 16 and in 20 and i i remember after operation castled um because I, i had like friends on the ground during operation castled that activists lawyers were saying Israel shot itself in the foot that's it you know they've gone too far you know it's over and it's gone back to the same routine and status quo so how do we make sure that this time it changes everything and how do we make sure that accountability that actually people that have committed war crime and crimes against humanity like Netanyahu and others actually end up at the Hague or you know how do how do we make sure this changes everything. Well, you've asked me about activists and you've asked me about lawyers and I think my answer is different um depending on your role in this. In terms of activists, citizens, um people of conscience all over the world, I think the single most important thing that they can do in this moment is to exercise very vocal political solidarity with Palestinians. That is really what we need right now. We need pressure from the grassroots on a wide scale. Um and historically any time we look at you know freedom movements and people who have succeeded in freeing themselves from colonial domination and oppression it has always been a combination of factors that led to the downfall of colonialism in that instance um so certainly the grassroots have to be well engaged they have to speak up they have to use their voices they have to attend protests they have to participate in actions of civil disobedience direct action they have to occupy their you know representatives offices they have to refuse to leave without a meeting um they have to insist in the meeting on a ceasefire now and not only on a ceasefire now but an end to the occupation a dismantlement of the apartheid regime a release of all the political prisoners the enforcement of the palestinian right to return and and so on so that's for the grassroots in terms of lawyers i think lawyers have to do what we've always done which is try to exercise a maximum amount of pressure through the legal avenues that are available and in in doing so um make it very clear to these legal institutions that have been mandated to uphold international human rights law and international humanitarian law that if they do not act in this moment that they will cement themselves as completely useless and obsolete and that that will deeply deeply undermine their legitimacy going forward in the future and in fact it may very well lead to their extinction 
Um, so I think part of that involves bringing legal actions, but I think it also involves a sustained um, media campaign to put pressure on these institutions, to, to force them in a corner and to get them to explain to us why they're not acting in this moment. Why is it that the International Criminal Court, a week into the Russian invasion of Ukraine, opened an investigation into war crimes, including genocide, and quickly rushed after that to issue an arrest warrant for Putin, whereas in this moment, where, where we are seeing the clearest, most documented case of genocide that we have ever seen on our smartphones playing out, you know, day in and day out, combined with genocidal intent that continues to be reaffirmed every single day, that the ICC hasn't acted. There's not a single reason why the ICC has not acted, save for the fact that it is not proceeding in an even-handed way to actually apply the law to offenders, but that it is proceeding in a politically motivated way. And once the application of the law becomes political, well, then you can throw it all away because the whole point of the law is the notion that it's applied equally to all offenders, not only in some cases to, to offenders who are enemies of the West or who are, you know, black and brown people, but to everybody. And, you know, we've actually already seen um, in 2019, the Trump administration sanctioned the International Criminal Court and its then prosecutor um, for opening an investigation into war crimes committed by the U.S. in Afghanistan and war crimes committed by Israel and Palestine, because that investigation was actually opened many, you know, several years ago. It hasn't moved very far since, presumably because of this political pressure by Western states. And so we have a deep crisis of institutions which are supposed to, I mean, which, which have been created for the sole purpose of, like, let's be very clear, created for the sole purpose of preventing and sanctioning offenders of genocide. That's the only reason the International Criminal Court exists, is to, is to provide... Um, is to carry out a strong um, role in the fight against impunity. And if it is not in this moment seeking to investigate Israel for genocide and its apartheid regime, and in this moment lets impunity reign again, well, then there's nothing left for Israel to do. It's already committed the crime of all crimes against Palestinians. That will just give it the final assurance that it needs that it can carry out a total ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from Palestine and that nobody will stop to interfere. So the stakes are very high. And I mean, you know, we can go into like what that means going forward for international law as, as a system, as, as a body of law. It's actually very dangerous. Israel will succeed in changing the law if they're not sanctioned for their violations in this moment. Um, there's a lot that we can say about this conversation, but I think, you know, to be brief, the most important thing for any actor in this moment is to exercise pressure where they can. For lawyers, that means bringing legal actions, putting a maximum amount of PR and media pressure on those legal actions and forcing these institutions to act. And for anyone else, that means doing what you do best and just using your skills and, 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 and the tools that you have at your disposal to shed as much light on this situation as you can. Thanks, Lara. Thank you so much.